today we will have a seminar by our new employee Omid Mahmali and pa Professor Nurovsky will start with a with short introduction. Pavel, please. Yes, thank you very much for giving me opportunities to speak about Omid. So Omid Okmali is uh, a member of our uh, Greek grant uh, team. In this Greek grant team, we have one physicist who is Jarosław Kopiński. We have, and we have two mathematicians, Katia Sagersnik and Omid Makmali. And we have me who is kind of a hybrid. And so now let's let me turn back to Omid. Uh, Omid Makmali graduated from uh, McGill University in Montreal. He's pure mathematician. Uh, he is associated with Poland for a while because he was uh, for, uh, sele selected a few years ago uh, to be a member of uh, Simon semester, which uh, I co-organized at uh, Institute of Mathematics of Polish Academy of Sciences. Then as a member of the Simon semester, he was chosen to be a postdoc at Institute of Mathematics of Polish Academy of Sciences. Then he came after one year or two years spending in at Impan, he went to um, Czech Republic where he was postdoc at mathematics department at Brno University, at, at Masaryk University in Brno. And now he's back in Poland and joining our uh, Greek team. Omid is both Canadian and Persian and maybe he, he will refresh our Sarmatian blood here in Poland. So, Omid, please. Thank you very much, Pavel, for this introduction. I, uh, I'm very glad to be able to uh, talk about my work here. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. So let me uh, share. So um, I'm going to um, talk about the the main topic of the talk will be um, causal structures, uh, by which uh, it's usually meant the uh, structure that is defined in terms of causal relationships between um, points or events in the space-time geometry. It has a very long history and uh, we're not going to cover most of it, but instead I'll, I'll be focusing on uh, differential geometric aspects of it. And again, this is uh, very well studied when these causal structures arise from Lorentzian metrics. But the idea of the talk is to broaden the setting to, you know, uh, beyond Lorentzian metrics and show that there is a differential geometric picture in the background and one can in fact do computations and have differential calculus. Along the way, we'll encounter and make use of some other geometric structures that uh, yeah, we'll see. So, but first let me start by making some confessions. Uh, as Pavel said, said, I'm not a physicist, but uh, I like physics and I like physicists. Um, so I have a background in differential geometry and that's uh, what my research is mostly about. And I know among uh, natural scientists, when it comes to mathematicians, uh, opinion is divided. And uh, I remember coming across this quote, uh, which says, a mathematician is a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat that is not there, which I assume is trying to convey a sense of being lost and uh, when I realized that it was attributed to Darwin, it made me quite upset because he's a personal hero of mine. Um, so, you know, I had, to, I had to go through some soul searching until I realized that it's actually not from Darwin, it's attributed to many other people. And in fact, I agree with part of it in the sense that it's uh, beneficial to be guided by physics and in fact, it, it feels good sometimes. So <clears throat> with that in mind, let me uh, start by motivating 
and perhaps a, a quick overview of some of the uh, concepts we're going to see and define more precisely later by uh, giving a rather unconventional formulation of general relativity. And this is called the constructive axiomatic approach to GR that was proposed by Ehlers, Pirani, and Schild in 1972. It follows ideas of Hermann Weyl. Uh, so in his book, uh, Weyl sort of has a uh, similar picture. In group. And uh, similar ideas also were proposed by many other people, including Singh, Trotman, and many others. So in this approach, the idea is to take light rays and freely falling particles as fundamental concepts and uh, um, to uh, <coughs> sort of have a set of axioms, to use a set of axioms, and uh, the axioms sort of uh, make use of chronological data that arises from these light rays and freely falling particles, and they induce step by step a hierarchy of geometric structures. It starts from very coarse geometric structures to finer and richer uh, structures. So remember the general idea in the, uh, space time is that um, at each point, let's say at this point, these blue lines are the uh, light rays emerging here from these directions and uh, emitting uh, here. So time is, uh, this direction is time uh, going uh, up. And um, <coughs> the set of light rays span a cone that emerge at this point. So this is, this, uh, uh, this distorted cone is like the past sky at this point. And the uh, li light rays that emit from this point, the set of them give the future sky uh, at this point, and the velocity of light at this point give, a, give exactly a cone at the tangent space of this point. So these are the velocities of um, light rays emitting from this point or emerging. And I've sort of distorted the light cones because of what I'm going to talk about. And then there are these freely falling particles that sort of follow their a trajectory that is their world line is called, and they lie inside the cone. They cannot reach the speed of light, and by freely falling, it means that they're not exposed to external force. So this is the general picture, and the uh, axioms, the set of axioms they have. Um, the first outcome of it is that space-time is a topological and differentiable four-dimensional matter. So this again has a long history going back to uh, Reichenbach as, a, as far as I know and many other people along the way that sort of start to uh, you know make different assumptions about causality relations and all different kinds of causality and uh, which affects the topology in some sense uh, a differential structure of the manifold. In particular this last one Woodhouse uh, made a, a kind of a, a great contribution to this uh, uh, axiomatic approach. And some people even call it Ellis Pirani Shield Woodhouse. But this is this first stuff when we're going to take for granted. And then there is this uh, second outcome, which says that the light rays, as I mentioned previously, the light rays, the speed of light at each point gives light cones. And this is mathematically is referred to as a conformal Lorentzian structure that we're going to define all this more precisely later. And um, so this is an additional structure, a little bit uh, finer. And then there are the world line of uh, free falling particles, which they follow what's called the geodesic on the uh, space. So we're gonna not consider the parametrization arising from time, we just consider the trajectory uh, on parametrized curves. And they again induce an additional structure called the projective structure. So you have geodesics that are sort of geodesics of some affine connection on your space time. Then you assume some compatibility, they assume some compatibility condition in the sense that you want the light rays here to also be a geodesic here. Then this sort of pins down and a, a distinguished connection. So your space time now has a sort of distinguished connection. And again, Just, uh, may I ask a question? Yes, it is. This connection is 
symmetric or not necessarily symmetric? They assume that, it, I mean, it doesn't, having symmetric or non symmetric doesn't uh, uh, make difference in the projected. Yes, this is precisely my this point. Is, because exactly. So they actually, that's what I'm going to say, that later they also say that you can allow torsion in the connection and sort of uh, make use of these Einstein Carton uh, geometry. Uh, so they allow this, but in this paper that they sort of propose these set of axioms, here they go after torsion-free connection, symmetric connection. Yeah, yeah, of course, because non-symmetric connection is not an irreducible uh, structure. Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, so this now, I mean, I have to say they are not so rigorous in the paper. And uh, in fact, what they mean by this compatibility condition is only clarified recently and, and nicely in two papers, in these two papers. And then again, uh, they, their axioms, little by little, get a little bit less satisfying. And uh, they, for instance, for this file connection, they say that it's we set the length curvature of this uh, vial connection equal to zero because of some empirical evidence, which again, they don't really give axioms for. So it's less and less satisfying as we go uh, further. And this way they sort of pin down a metric in the conformal class up to a constant. Then uh, at the end in a follow-up paper, Ehlers actually says that proposes an ansatz and says, by, by applying Lovelock's theorem, you can, one can recover Einstein's field equation. So this is sort of, these points are not really uh, of interest for me right now, at least. Um, I'm going to talk about these two points that according to their set of axioms or the outcomes of the axioms, one can generalize this null cone structure to some sort of more general cones. You can distort the cones, make them not necessarily uh, cones that arise from a Lorentzian metric. The only caveat is that there are differentiability issues at the zero section of the tangent line. And some argue this is actually not a big deal. One can live with that. So I sort of, uh, it, at least it's a motivation for me to uh, consider this case, even if did affect some differentiability at the zero section. May I ask a question? Yes, yes. Again, what do you mean by a light a cone, by a cone? What is a cone? Is it is just a cone in the sense of, of uh, the uh, second order uh, equation, given by second order equation? You know, it does, that's exactly the point. It doesn't have to be second order. So you can allow, you know, fourth order. You can allow ah, ah, okay. it, it so completely it is analytic not function. Because if you have uh, true light, uh, sorry, true cone, uh, cone which is second order, then, then immediately this conformal structure arises. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's that's right. So I'm going to again uh, more precisely say what I mean. That's that's exactly right. Yeah. And uh, again, another generalization that I'm not going to discuss is that this geodesics, this word lines, they assume to arise from projective structure. But again, one can assume that in some regions of space-time, they don't have to, you know, or be geodesics of some connection. So instead, just you're dealing with some lines, some world lines that are sort of, they induce a sort of uh, more general structure that's called a path structure, or a path geometry in the space-time. And again, this has problems if you want to really have infinitesimally at each point Newton's law of inertia because Newton's law of inertia says that uh, these paths when you infinitesimalize at each point they have to be sort of uh, solutions of a trivial set of second order root roots but in any case uh, if one assumes things are I don't know in some regions might be different or very small these generalizations are possible but one has to be careful. Just one last thing is that I'm not going to talk about much about this path structure, but historically in mathematicians have studied the, this geometries uh, much uh, earlier than uh, the study of these cone structures. So that's just a mathematical uh, research topic. This has an older history. 
So another uh, motivation at least one can uh, consider uh, for broadening a set of causal structures from out beyond Lorentzian metrics is alternative views on light propagation. So there's a widely accepted axiom in physics that says speed of light at each point along each direction is constant. So in particular, that implies you know, the speed of light in each time, the velocity that corresponds to light at each point span a cone that is quadratic or of second order. So for instance, in Minkowski space, you have this cone at each tangent space. And there are some alternative models uh, for light propagation in mediums that are anisotropic, which actually says it do not assume this axiom. So there are some Kinslerian models. For instance, there is this book by Perlich where such models are discussed, I think, for the first time. And as an example, that kind of interesting, some people argue that what happens in birefringent crystals might be interesting. So these are crystals that when you send a beam of light uh, inside, two beams will come out. So this suggests at least for some people uh, that when light goes through here, then sort of one can assume that there at each point, there are two future light cones. So there are two connected components and they, because at each point along each uh, light like direction, there passes a unique light geodesic, light like geodesic. But here you have two coming out at the end. So some people suggest to model this, you can assume that at each point, instead of one light future light cone, you have two future light cones. So this is some suggestion that uh, some people have used to but, hook up but, some models. But uh, both of them are of second order? Yes, yes, yes. They assume that, again, they, they assume, so it's basically a product of two Lorentzian metrics. Yes. And- they uh, tangent to each other or no? No, no, no. So they're exactly one cone and then another cone sort of uh, okay. containing it. Not, yes. not tangent. Okay. Yes. Uh, or they can be- tangent And of course, and of course it's important that both velocities are smaller than C. Well, now, yeah, yes, if there is a C, I mean, it, yeah, of course, but that's going to uh, So there is, uh, um, lastly, I just want to mention, I have no much comment about this, but some argue that Pinsler gravity has advantages to Einstein theory in the sense that maybe one doesn't need to introduce notions such as uh, dark matter, dark energy, but really I have <coughs> not much to say in this. Uh, matter. So now let's uh, give uh, perhaps a more precise uh, definition of um, one of the main objects here, and it's a Lorentzian metric in dimension four, which you can introduce in two equivalent ways. One of them, uh, or most conventional one, is to say at each tangent space of your four-dimensional space-time, you are given a symmetric bilinear form. Uh, which has signature plus minus minus minus. So this is a four by four symmetric matrix, GIJ, and uh, it has 10 components and it has one positive eigenvalue and three negative. So it's an inner product. At each uh, tangent space, you have an inner product of uh, uh, Lorentzian signature. Another way is sort of a little bit more geometric, depending on <laughs> how you think it's, uh, to introduce instead of this bilinear form at each point, to introduce the set of velocities whose norm is equal to one, okay, unit velocities. If you introduce this at each tangent space, and it's, uh, remember the set of these null, the set of unit velocities, they are a hypersurface, you refer to as affine hypersurface, there's a hypersurface and they're quadrants, they're set order two, they're second degree, because uh, here you see that there's a, uh, uh, this is an equation of a second degree in, in, in velocities, right? And um, so it's a quadric in tangent space. So given a quadric in each tangent space, having this tangent, uh, this quadric is equivalent to giving this uh, bilinear form at each point. So we're gonna make use of this second uh, uh, point of view later on to generalize. 
And Riemannian metric uh, is again the same way you can uh, define, but here the signature would be positive. And a conformal Lorentzian structure is basically a, a class of Lorentzian metrics that are all proportional to each other by a non-vanishing uh, function on your manifold. So it, you don't have a distinguished Lorentzian metric anymore. You have a sort of a, a, a little bit less information. You have a class of metrics and they're all proportional and they're all Lorentzian. Alternatively, instead of giving it this class, you can just give a set of cones, which are the set of light cones of, let's say, any of these metrics in this conformal class. Okay, so th these cones again are, are of uh, second uh, order. And uh, um, so they're quadratic. And uh, if two metrics differ by a you know, scale, their null cones exactly coincide. They share the same null cone, but this guy, this unit sphere, this, fun, this uh, set of unit velocities, they're different. So for this one, if you add like a sigma squared here, then uh, the unit sphere will be different from point to point. In fact, they're scale of each other in each kind of sphere, they get scaled. But the uh, null cone, it coincides for all the metrics in the conformal class. And if you have the null cone, in fact, you're able to recover this uh, matrix Gij up to a constant. So this is a sort of a not so trivial theorem in linear algebra. And again, because this is a cone, so a cone has these line generators, okay? And this line generators, you don't really, they're, I mean, you know you're dealing with a cone. So you can projectivize, you can go to the, uh, space of lines, okay, and get rid of these line generators of the cone. Or alternatively, you can think about just working with a cross section of the cone. So, a cross section of the, let's say, future cone is called future sky, a cross section of the you know, past cone, past light cone is called past sky. And you can, even for our purposes, we're going to identify both of them and just call the sky bar. So this is a section, let's say in Lorentzian, at each point, it's a section of, the, of a quadratic cone which you can identify with two-dimensional sphere. So your sky is basically a diffeomorphic two-dimensional sphere. So this uh, object uh, is, uh, uh, this is six-dimensional. Remember that M is four-dimensional, it's tangent polygon, is eight-dimensional. Uh, and then uh, you have a cone which gives, again, a cone is a three-dimensional thing in each tangent space, and you projectivize it. So you're dealing with four-dimensional manifold and a bunch of spheres on top. These are the skies, so two-dimensional spheres on top. So you have a six-dimensional four-manifold four and uh, a field of spheres on top of it, which are the skies. Now we want to generalize this set, and we want to give a Finzerian generalization, and uh, to, to Sort of help understand what, what this is, this is a quote from Chern that says Finzer geometry is just Riemannian geometry without the quadratic restriction. Because so this is now we're dealing with Finzer, which is analog of Riemannian. They're gonna make we're gonna make a Lorentzian analog and then define what generalize it for a cone structure, uh, generalize this conformal Lorentzian metric. So this remember in Riemannian, we, we assume that again there's a inner product at each tangent space, and it's positive definite. So you just, things of geometry, you don't assume it's a, it's an, it comes from, it's an inner product. It can be something uh, more general, uh, can be third degree, fourth degree, can be a, really any kind of norm you can put on your tangent space. So, and in fact, this was suggested in Riemann habilitation originally, but he, uh, considered Riemannian because it makes a huge simpl uh, simplification in computations uh, that he <coughs> carried out later. But this general setting was in fact uh, done by Paul Finzer in his thesis in 1918 and uh, Hilbert uh, really promoted it uh, because he viewed it as a geometric setup for the calculus of variation because now you don't have just the Riemannian metric, you have any norm. So it can be sort of, it can uh, present 
represent a cost function. Okay, so you want to minimize certain cost function. And you again have the same technology you have in Riemannian geometry. You can define geodesics and you can optimize uh, this uh, you know, certain problem that is more general than Riemannian geometry. And there were significant contributions by many people, including mainly from, mainly from Cotton and Chern. So again, to get a better feeling of what happens in fields of geometry, I'm going <coughs> to discuss a very interesting and famous problem called the uh, Zermelo navigation problem. And I'm going to state it in this way. Uh, basically, we want to see how does a wildfire spread in the presence of wind. Um, so this is completely physical model of some, some natural thing. And um, a, perhaps the most intuitive model for this, as far as I know, is called Randers matrix, which is, again, outside of the realm of Riemannian geometry. It's purely from Zeri. So to <coughs> the idea is the following, that let's say you're working on certain a manifold, and then um, you have a Riemannian matrix. Start with a Riemannian matrix, you know, setting. So this dotted ellipsoid, is the set of unit velocities, right? And then let's say at this point, there's wind with velocity v along this direction. So this tangent speed, this velocity represents the speed of wind. And then you translate the set of unit velocities exactly this much, and you end up with a new ellipsoid on your manifold at each point. So this is now uh, announced this as uh, declared this as the set of unit vectors for this norm, which you know this is again can, this is the equation for this ellipse for some uh, one form wi that you can relate to this speed v. So this is uh, purely Finzerian. It doesn't come from an inner product on the tangent space, and it sort of encodes this drift from the wind. And you, if you want to see, let's say, what's the fastest way to go from one point to another, to another in the presence of wind, you just find the geodesics of this Binzer metric. And this is, again, everything very similar to the Riemannian case. So in particular, for this case, you can, uh, as an example, you have, this, uh, you have this drift at each point. Let's say the speed of wind changes from point to point. And then you sort of write this ellipsoid accordingly, uh, cook it up and at each point. And then you can find, let's say, starting from this point in time, you can exactly find the wavefronts of a fire that starts from here and then spreads. So I would like to now share uh, another. Uh, so let me show the a animation. So let me stop here and share another one. Uh, which is this one. Okay, so, um, so in here, uh, <coughs> we'll see that, um, so starting again, um, let's say the fire starts from here, and then your, this set of unit velocities that encode the wind can also change in time, right? They can change in time. And again, in the spirit of Eugen's principle, you just find the wave front at each point according to these uh, uh, mini wave fronts here, and then form an envelope of the new front. And then you can also cook up what would be the sort of optimizing curves that the uh, fire would follow and spread. And here the wind is encoded in any of these, uh, you know, these uh, ellipsoids. And uh, and this is again a so very interesting work done by Steen uh, Markhorsen, and these are all belong to an example that he cooked up in his paper. So now let me go back. Mm. Yeah. So um, now let's go to a Lorentzian analog of this uh, <coughs> setting. And we want to, because we're dealing with local nature, of, uh, of these geometries. And um, <clears throat> this, we want to avoid any sort of uh, crazy behavior, right? Because we want to, the idea is the following that you no longer, your, the set of unit velocities no longer is assumed to be a quad quadric, to have a quadratic, satisfy quadratic relation, second order, rela second degree relation. 
So it can be quite wide. So you can have, let's say, the set of unit velocities have singularity, can have intersection, can have even multiple components, connected components. So in order to avoid this, we're just going to restrict at each tangent space to like the set, then open set, sort of around those velocities that behave nicely. This uh, set of unit velocities are nicely behaving. And uh, so we're going to define a, a, lo a local Lorentz Vinson structure as uh, on a manifold in terms of a field. Um, so we're going to restrict to an open subset of the tangent bundle of the manifold. And in that open subset, there is a connected, so we cannot have multiple connected components, connected strongly complex hypersurface that sort of doesn't contain the origin. So this is the idea, the generalization. You just, you can think about Lorentzian metrics, take the uh, set of unit velocities and distort it, okay? You can even distort it very, you know, a lot. Um, so this hypersurface doesn't need to be algebraic even, right? No, 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 it doesn't have to be. It, it can be extremely wide. Yeah. And then... Uh, neither, neither symmetric. Yeah, well, actually, yes. You, it doesn't have to be symmetric, exactly. It can be uh, that the non-symmetric uh, case is actually of very important, much importance in this Windsor business. And uh, so locally, again, this uh, <coughs> set of... Uh, unit velocities, you can cook up a defining function, let's say an analog of your bilinear form, that is a Finzer norm, such that uh, it's unit, it's one on that um, set of what you declared as the set of unit velocities, and it has nice behavior in the sense that it's a second derivative with respect to uh, vertical, with respect to velocity coordinates, is has signature, Lorentzian signature plus minus one. Um, so again, in the Riemannian setting, that's again the same thing, that you have unit sphere, and then you distort this uh, set of units, unit velocities and make it non-quadratic, can be anything. Now, this, th the same sense we can generalize, you know, light cone structures arising from Lorentzian matrix. So this light cone structures, remember, uh, so let's say in dimension three, okay, your cones are, let's say, something like this at a point, right? And then take a cross-section of this, right? If you take a cross-section of this cone, it's, uh, it's a circle, right? If you're working in three dimensions. But then we allow the circle to be really dot, be anything. It can be even something like, you know, something like a spiral going this way and then coming back on itself. Or it can be an infinite spiral. It doesn't have to close up. So we can have all these, because we're dealing with local nature, and we want to really uh, consider the most general case and see what happens, what's the differential geometric picture behind it, how we can compute, we can even allow these settings. So in the, again, in this case, we're going to only work in uh, open sets where this thing behaves nicely. Okay? And compute there. See how we can compute, actually. Figure out how we can compute. Um, so you're giving a you're given a cone which we call again the sky bundle similar to the conformal Lorentzian case, and this cone is supposed to be the only condition is that it's strongly convex at each tangent space. Again, you can cook up a uh, something like a Lagrangian for this, so that these cones are the vanishing set of this Lagrangian function, and the vertical hessian of the Lagrangian has Lorentzian signature. So just to mention. If you have, let's say, this is your cone, then it's not like Lorentzian picture that then you have these Lorentzian metrics and their unit sphere gets scaled. Actually, you have might have the Omid, same. Omid, say, say, please say that Hessian is some something like second derivatives, right? Oh yeah. So I, I defined it in the previous slide. So the Hessian by Hessian we mean the matrix form. It's it's uh, this matrix, this one. So the second the matrix formed by the second derivative with respect to velocities, all the velocities. So this gives a four by four matrix. So in this case, uh, this is mean, I, I'm working with the vertical Hessian of this function L. And this is non degenerate. Um, so here, again, you might have in your cone, this, you know, the Fins and Lorentz, the unit velocities that you can correspond to a given cone that is not necessarily quadrant can be extremely different. They are not necessarily a scale of each other. 
unlike the conformal domain surface. Anyway, this is just some unimportant remarks. So now we have the geometric structure. Okay, how do we compute in this geometric setting, more general geometric setting? How do we, you know, compare two different uh, types of this geometric structure? How do we say they're just simply the same, but in, only in different coordinates, or if they are, you know, equivalent or they are not equivalent? How do we do this? So let me review that in uh, uh, Lorentzian geometry, there is the notion of Levi-Civita connection that again goes back a long time ago. And using this Levi-Civita connection, one can compute, do computations, and find what's called the fundamental invariant of the geometry, which is the Riemann curvature. Okay, this has all the information. If you know two metri Lorentzian metrics are isom isometric, then they have the, the, the Riemannian invariant, Riemann invariant, Riemann curvature can be solved. So in particular, if it's zero, then you know the, no matter what kind of representation, what kind of expression the metric has, you know that it's locally the same as Minkowski space. In conformal Lorentzian, you have something similar to the Civita connection called normal Cartan conformal connection. And then with that, you can do computations. And again, something like a fundamental invariant would be the vial curvature that distinguishes conformal structures from each other. And if it's zero, then you know your space is conformally equivalent to the Minkowski space. There's a conformal factor. If you scale it enough appropriately, it's this, you get Minkowski space. So in this lorentz Finzer geometry, again, there's, you have a connection that allows you to compute. And this, actually, there's not one. There are at least four well-known connections. And <clears throat> you can cook up something similar to Riemann curvature. And in this case, there are actually two fundamental invariants. One is called the flag curvature and the other one is called Cartan torsion. Okay, this Cartan torsion corresponds to exactly the set of unit velocities. That if it's not quadratic, then this Cartan torsion is not zero. But if both of them are zero, then you know again, your this Lorentz Spinzer uh, uh, space is isometric to the locally Minkowski space. And uh, finally, for this is what I did in my uh, thesis, is that when you're dealing with these cone structures, again, you have, one just needs to realize that this cone structure corresponds to certain, it's more generalized uh, uh, setting of cones. They, in fact, correspond to certain geometric structures known as parabolic geometries. And there is, a, again, a connection there that allows you to compute and there are two invariants, similar to the Finzer case. One of them is, I call, vial flat curvature, and the other one is Fubini cubic form. And um, if they vanish, you know that, again, like in this case, your causal structure is locally equivalent to the Minkowski space. But remember, if one of them vanish only, then this is not true. So examples of these cone structures. The most symmetric example, the one that you know is the flat model, is uh, the nicest one, as we know, is again the same as conformal structures, and uh, this is you know conformal Minkowski space that we know has 15-dimensional symmetry. It's the conformal group, which is the Poincaré group, and uh, conformal inversions and dilation. Then uh, remember the Minkowski space is uh, the metric. The Minkowski metric is given by this expression where p is equal to two, right? So you can assume, can consider, okay, what's the general, a generalization would be when you assume this p to be something other than two, <coughs> larger than two, okay? So this defines a cone at each tangent space again. And it turns out that this, this more general structure has six dimensional symmetry. And in fact, this sky bundle is not homogeneous. So it's uh, not, nothing, it's not at all as nice. It dramatically affects the behavior, the algebraic behavior of- uh, uh, And no matter how big is P- Yeah, no, no matter how big it is, it's always this, uh, yeah. But it's a different group, but it's always the same behavior. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But in fact, this is not the most symmetric model. You can actually uh, find uh, examples of cone structures that have seven dimensional symmetry group, okay? Instead, not 15, nothing, but the second most symmetric causal structures that are not conformal have seven dimensional symmetry uh, group. And in fact, they're not unique 
and their light, light cones, they, they're singular, but they're all uh, homogeneous. So an example of this would be like this. I give you just three of them. There are more. So this is like of second order. Uh, this is second order. This one is not always convex. And this is the only one that is algebraic. And these are quite, you know, not <laughs> so pleasant expressions, but uh, Yes. Omid, Omid, perhaps you should say that that, that submaximal model means that if you find a model with symmetry, let's say eight dimensional, it means that this locally the Minkowski one is fifteen dimensional symmetry. So there is a big gap in symmetry yeah, between exactly. fifteen dimensions exactly. and, you, you, and seven you, dimensions of these models. Yeah, yeah. So when you go for the second most symmetric causal structure that is actually not with not quadratic cones, you lose a huge amount of symmetry. Okay, another example uh, would be a Fizeria analog of uh, Einstein's static universe. And uh, um, so you have S3 and equip this S S three-dimensional sphere, equip the second uh, three-dimensional sphere with the Finzer structure. So not necessarily in one metric, the Finzer structure. And then um, it's just like in the Einstein's static universe, you can cook up a cone at each point of the tangent, at each tangent space of, of M, by just taking velocities in the tangent space, so this is a velocity, and then compute the norm of this part of the velocity belonging to three-dimensional sphere in terms of the Finzer metric, and then subtract this part of the velocity and put it equal to zero. So this will give you a cone at each point of M. And um, so it turns out now you, this, this M has, a, you know, if, if this is Finsler, in general, this cone is not quadratic. Right? Um, and again, you can, you know, work with certain, there, there's a huge amount of uh, um, study on Finsler metrics on two-dimensional and three-dimensional spheres where this uh, flat curvature, this one of the invariants of Finsler metric is constant or scalar. And uh, you can relate this to the uh, invariance of this causal structure of M. So you know, you have information on Finzer structure here, and you can, you know structure and the causal structure of this, this, this product space. Um, so for instance, if this Finzer metric on S is randers, the thing we defined previously, then this cause the cones here would be just quadratic. You have a, an honest conformal Lorentzian structure here. And as I said, there's like a very active research on you know Finzer structures on S3, and they can be extremely weird and strange. And um, um, where, with, where, with, where this flat curvature is plus one constant, and the geodesics are the great circles. And it's not unique. You have a lot, uh, lot of um, choice to choose from. So now let's uh, start to do some computations. And uh, to do some computation, uh, perhaps the most important part uh, would be to define what I call a projective Hilbert form. So let's say you have your cones at each tangent space, and they're given by vanishing of some Lagrangian L. And then at each point of the cone, you form this following expression. So this is a one form in each tangent space of your you know, bundle of cones. And this one form basically does for you what a Lorentzian metric does in the case of conformal Lorentzian structure. So you have to work with this cone, deal with it. It needs a lot more manipulation to be able to, you know, get like a connection and then compute in this uh, causal for these causal with these causal structures an invariant way of viewing this is that when you have a cone if this is your cone at each tangent space then along each ray uh, at each point of this cone and along each ray you have a hyperplane that is tangent to the cone along this ray so at this point the annihilator of this hyperplane the annihilator defines a one form up to a scale, right? And that's exactly this form. This has this uh, expression in terms of the defining function. 
And then again, you assume that the cones are nice, strongly convex. This is, this is what I mean by strongly convex. I should have written this, which means the, this matrix, four by four matrix, the vertical Hessian has maximum length. And it turns out that this one form is very special. It actually induces what's known as a quasi convex structure. So that means if you form these following expressions, you take omega, wedge it with, with the exterior derivative of omega, and which this is two wedge products of the exterior derivative of omega, then it's non-zero. If you, if you wedge it with itself, three times you get zero. So this is like the most, the highest rank condition for a one form on an even dimensional manifold. So in odd dimensions, we can have this, maybe you know what's known as a contact structure, and in even dimension, this is an analog. So because of this rank condition, you will see that it has a degeneracy. It has a degenerate direction. It has to have. By which we mean that there is a direction, let's say, that corresponds to a vector field, which uh, makes omega and d omega zero. So if you feed omega and d omega with this v, it, both of them vanish. Mm -hmm. And in fact, starting from this expression, you can exactly write what this uh, vector field is, what this degenerate direction of your one form, Hilbert form form is, which is of this form. So it turns out if you start this L is actually a Lorentzian metric, that means if it's quadratic in Y in velocity, then this expression exactly corresponds to light, light rays in Lorentzian metrics. Right? Um, so when you form this uh, uh, vertical Hessian, you get constant uh, coefficients depend, you know, at each tangent space. And then um, this would be, uh, this would give you no geodes light like geodesics in Lorentzian space. So now I'm gonna define uh, another uh, notion, uh, a stationary causal structure. That means you have these you know, field of cones and then you have a vector field, a causal killing vector field, that is transversal to this uh, distribution, uh, which is the, uh, which we call the quasi-contact distribution. So the quasi-contact distribution is the kernel of omega. So it's a, it's a co-rank one set of uh, velocities. It's a constraint on your velocities. So, uh, more precisely, I mean the lead derivative of this defining function along this vector field is proportional to itself. And then when you feed the uh, vector field to this Hilbert one form, you get something non-zero. So this is the main theorem that I would like to talk about. And I think it has some nice geometric picture. And instead of reading the theorem, I'm just gonna draw this picture and show you on this picture. So you have these killing vector fields here, this black line that goes, and then uh, you have the light rays, these blue ones that is emitting, let's say from this point, right? And these dotted lines, again, they are, they are this killing, the trajectories of this killing vector field, right? They, they sort of along each, at each point along, uh, they, there passes a unique trajectory of this killing vector field. So this theorem, so first of all, take a hypersurface in your spacetime, right? And then the light rays, uh, you can project the light rays, okay, uh, to this hypersurface, and they're gonna give you paths on this hyperplane, on this hypersurface. These are these green paths on the hyperplane. And in fact, at each point of the hyperplane, along each direction, there passes a unique path that corresponds to a light ray in the space time. So each light ray projects to a unique path here. Right? And so the hypersurface basically has a path geometry. You have a family of paths and uh, there's a unique path through each point along each direction. And it turns out that these paths are in fact geodesics of some Finzer metric on this hyperplane whose flat curvature is plus one. So this is a very specific kind of things are metric. And uh, they are not just arbitrary paths. In fact, they're geodesics of some things are metric. So this is, I think, has some nice geometric picture uh, uh, 
for me at least. Uh, there is a, however, a uh, non-degenerative degenerative condition that I had to assume in this theorem for which I don't have a nice geometric interpretation. And this is again a partial generalization of a result of Gibbons and his collaborators. And they uh, show that if you start in um, <coughs> Minkowski space, conformal Minkowski space, and uh, consider a killing vector T and a hypersurface that is transversal to the trajectories of this killing vector T, then that hypersurface is endowed with a Randers metric, these random metrics we talked about, of Flacchio, which are possible. So I'm not saying what this Finzer metric, how is this Finzer structure on the hypersurface related to these cones, but here they say it's actually random. Another generalization we're working on with uh, two of my collaborators, Javier Lourdes and Sanchez. So to prove this theorem, I use some twistorial techniques that um, I'm going to talk about. Um, I, I try to be quick. Uh, perhaps this is the uh, rather most important slide. Um, so the twistorial picture is the following. You, instead of working on the space time, you go to the space of light rays, okay? So first of all, you need this definition. A causal structure is civilized. If you go to the space of light rays, you get a manifold. You get a smooth and Hausdorff manifold. So it has a nice structure, the set of light rays, okay? This is not the case. This is usually not the case because uh, you know, these light rays can act, you have, can have very strange behaviors and this space of them would be something completely wild. But here it's called civilized the causal structure if the space of light rays is nice. And in fact, you can again have a notion of global hyperbolic causal structures and their space of knowledge is, is civilized. Or locally, you don't have to consider things globally, locally around each light ray, if you just uh, consider a open subset, an open neighborhood of a part of a light ray, then you know, go to the space of light rays in that neighborhood and again you get some nice um, manifold as the space of light rays. And the idea that we do comes from to work with this weird space comes from Penrose's non-linear graviton construction where he actually says space-time is not really the fundamental object. One has to take twister space or later uh, people <coughs> change it to ambi-twister space, sort of uh, switch to another space, ambi-twister space as the fundamental object. And the space-time information actually are derived from some complex geometric structure on this space of light rays, on this ambi-twister space. So that's just a sort of twister theory, the twister philosophy of uh, <coughs> Pendles. So remember that we said these null geodesics uh, or these light-like geodesics, these light rays, are generated by vector field that is degenerate for this Hilbert form V. So if you go to the space of these uh, uh, sort of trajectories of this V, you basically get rid of the degeneracy direction of omega, right? So you go to the space of these degenerate directions and this five-dimensional manifold is now has a has now a contact what's known as a contact structure. Remember that this sky bundle is here. The sky bundle where you have the geodesics uh, foliating the sky bundle. Now you go to the space of these curves, these light light curves, and you lose one dimension. Right? You get a, a five dimensional one. So <coughs> now remember that the as we saw, the ca a causal structure uh, has two invariants, similar to this Riemann curvature in you know, Riemannian geometry. The causal structure has two fundamental invariants. We call one of them vial flag curvature, W, and Fubini cubic form that I denote by F. So there are three cases, basically the most uh, <coughs> obvious cases to look at is when this F is zero. So if F is zero, you are in the realm of conformal Lorentzian structure. So the cones are quadratic. This, this is completely well understood. There's locally, there's nothing new here. But then when W is equal to zero, you're exactly orthogonal to the class of conformal structures. So these are kind of the next most interesting causal structures to consider. 
And in this case, it turns out that this W, this contact distribution, which is by this I mean the, the kernel of this omega, the, uh, it's, a, it's a co rank one distribution. Uh, uh, this kernel of omega, the velocities that lie in the kernel of omega, they have an algebraic structure. And again, this is a geometric structure known as Lie contact structure. And in the general case, when none of them is zero, usually one cannot be set to M or N or another specifics. So as I said, we consider the case when W is equal to zero, and then it turns out this uh, <coughs> Uh, velocities. Remember, this is now velocities in the space of light rays. These velocities that are in the kernel of omega, they have an algebraic structure in the sense that, so the space of light rays, this was five dimensional, right? And then because you're working with velocities that are in the kernel of a one form, so they have rank four. Right? And then it turns out you can write them as a tensor product of two rank two vector one. So this is, again, an interesting algebraic structure we're not going to discuss. But what I want to emphasize is that one realizes that, again, there's a structure group acting on this H. And this structure group, so similar to, let's say, O4 in the Riemannian case, the orthogonal group, uh, four by four matrices, the structure group is of this form, GL2 times O2. And the whole thing I said here is to just realize that when we have GL2, it suggests that complex geometry is lurking behind, is, is somewhere that you can find a complex structure. So complex structure, uh, I mean an automorphism, linear automorphism of these h, these velocities in the kernel of omega, where their square is negative identity. Okay, so it seems like uh, one should be able to recover something complex. And again, it's a, a technique in uh, uh, standard technique in twisted theory that you can, it's hard to work with this, you know, there's no single of these automorphism J. In fact, you go and consider the set of these Js. You have a, uh, <coughs> and there's a two parameter value of these Js. And so if you, the idea is that you have a manifold and then there are these Js uh, defined over them, okay? There are many of them. You don't know what to do with. So what you do is to, you bundle all of them together. There's disk value of them. There's like a, um, they form a disk at each point. You form this disk on top of your manifold. And now you have a field, your manifold and a field of disks over it, which are all the uh, different types of almost complex structures. And then this bundle now tautologically has an, an tautological almost complex structure. So this is extremely over sophisticated, maybe if one is not familiar, but it's in fact, uh, I think it's an effective way. Omid, uh, sorry, sorry interrupting you. Please try to conclude. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so the idea is that what Penrose talked about, I'm almost finished, what uh, Penrose talked about is in fact true, and one has a complex geometry here. In fact, if one starts with a space time that is analytic, uh, one recovers, uh, one actually realizes that the space of light rays has a, uh, what's known as a CR structure. And this is again, very similar to what happens in, you know, Minkowski space, especially in the uh, uh, Polish school of general relativity, people worked with, you know, in the Minkowski space, the space of light rays has a CR geometry and it was used to, generate examples of three-dimensional CR sub-manifolds. And this is you know, one of the uh, successes in uh, this kind of uh, twister theory, I think, point of view, and pioneered by Troutman, Robinson, Lewandowski, Tafel, and our very own Pavel Murovsky. And uh, one can do the same thing here, assuming an ellipticity. Of course, one, this is not the only way one can get a CR, a complex structure on the space of light rays. As we said, Previously, stationary uh, causal structures also has that we used in the definition. Stationary causal structures, their space of light rays also has even a more refined version of the CR structure. So there's again complex geometry present as Penrose suggested fits into twister paradigm. And you can, I'm not gonna 
go how this stationary condition sort of induces a complex structure, the CR structure on the space of light rays. But this is pretty much, if you know how this works, if you know the proof of this theorem, then the main theorem I stated follows as a corollary that uh, you, know, you join it with another work of Bryant and uh, uh, which associates a complex geometric structure to a thin star structure of flat curvature plus one. And then uh, of course, we, I'm not going to discuss how it's done. This usually, um, you know, if you know what the proof is, uh, how, how the proof works, it's actually very easy to recover the proof of the main theorem as a corollary of this, uh, of this theorem I stated here. And just some further directions in this causal geometry uh, setting is that we're going to, um, at least in this Greek project, uh, to use uh, this parabolic nature of this um, causal structure um, to use what's known as a BGG operator in order to cook up uh, something uh, that can be called causal gravity. So in, com in conformal structures, the theory of co conformal gravity is very well known, and you can derive it from this BGG vector. So conformal structure is also parabolic. And you can use this to recover what a conformal gravity is. And then using that, you can actually recover what Einstein equation has to be. So it's a kind of a way of deriving Einstein equation without being smart, just using sophisticated mathematical tools you end up having knowing Einstein's equation in conformal in Lorentz structures. And in this case, it seems like one is able to also generalize this Einstein equation, this more general setting of when we distort the columns. And another one is to sort of generalize this, sort of in this spirit, generalize other geometric structures, such as Einstein viral in dimensions three and self dual conformal structures in dimension four, uh, which they actually have natural applications in the theory of integrable system and mathematical physics. Again, both of them are ongoing Greek projects. So thank you very much for your attention. Sorry if it was a little bit too abstract at the end. Thank you. We have a bit of time for questions. So, so can I ask? Yes, sure, please. So it's, it's an interesting, although rather abstract talk. Um, I just noticed some surprising overlap with my, with the last papers of our group. So, so we are working on general relativity and light propagation there uh, and on the geometry of null geodesics. And well, uh, I see interesting things where, 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 where we could share experiences except that I'm working with, with the standard quadratic um, metric. Um, well, out of things that, that um, I found really interesting is, is, is exactly this, this notion of, 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 uh, of, of how do you call it, the bundle of skies. Uh, but I understand that your skies also depend on the observer, right? Because you can slice the, 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 the light con man, many, infinitely many ways, right? Uh, dependence. So, so the thing is, if you think about it that way, if you think about it as a slice of the cone, then it suggests maybe it depends. But in fact, what I'm doing is that I'm not, slicing is just a way of interpreting it, but in fact, I'm projectivizing. So I'm, I'm basically, all these slices are, mm. um, yeah, are equivalent to each other. It doesn't matter how you slice it, but at the end of the day, it's just, uh, what matters really is the, this, notion of projectivization. I see, but there is the notion of physical um, distances uh, of distances on, on the celestial sphere or uh, the angle on the celestial sphere. And this is something that depends on your observer on, mm -hmm. on how you slice. So, so you could try to, to pull back a metric structure to these skies and then it depends on how, how you do it. We can talk about it later. That's oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be very glad. As I said, this is just um, uh, mostly I actually work with uh, the big conventional Lorentzian case, but I think this is another project I have on the side that I thought maybe there is some interest and wanted to sort of discuss it as just uh, yeah, something curious. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments? I, 
I have a comment. Uh, in fact, a historical remark. Let me remind you that an outstanding Polish mathematician, Lech Wolonowicz, who is mainly known as a uh, super expert in, uh, in uh, operator theory, then he, he is also a founder of uh, the so-called quantum groups and so on. He did his PhD uh, precisely in this type of, of uh, problems um, because he used to come sometimes to relativity sem seminar led by uh, Leopold Infeld and somebody was uh, had a seminar about uh, about Euler's uh, axiomatic approach and uh, Volonovich uh, seriously criticized this approach and uh, Infeld encouraged him to give the next uh, talk and explain us how should it be done and he did one uh, one week later and then uh, Infel decided that this will be your PhD. Okay. Yes, yes. This was probably in 67, I believe. Yes, so, so actually I was introduced to this uh, Pavel. But, uh, but, but of course these were just uh, cones, cones, second order, second order uh, equation. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. So this yes, is cone, yeah. But I actually found out uh, when uh, Pavel mentioned this, and I also found out in this paper of Woodhouse that he uh, again points out Voronovich, uh, Voronovich in as a citation. But unfortunately, I, I was looking for uh, his thesis, and it's unpublished and it's in Polish. But yeah, yeah, I'll, it be is to, yeah. I'll be able to. I, I would love to pick it. We, 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 we even we even contacted. Jurek, we, we even contacted uh, Professor Voronovich about his and, thesis and? and he said that he cannot dig it out, it must be somewhere at physics department, but there were only a few copies and it is in Polish. <laughs> of course it was in Polish. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, if not then... Let's thank our speaker. Thank you, Amit, for the nice talk and uh, see you, everybody, next week.